So now we are going to talk about pension. Do you know how much of your salary goes to pension? Oh, more or less, just half of it, maybe one third, great. Well, to be honest, before I started working in this pension fund, I had no idea about pension funds, retirement plans, or whatsoever. So now at least I can say that I learned that. So that's a, that's a bonus, I, I take it as a bonus, right? So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a story about how I joined this pension fund and how we established an in-house development team in the pension fund. And uh, this was a big journey for me and something uh, as a milestone because it was quite a different sector to work in. Before that, I was working in, I would say, traditional IT companies where we've been doing consultancy or IT products, but basically it's a complete IT world. Now, in the pension fund, you know that the business is about pension, right? You have to invest money, you have to work with money. This is the primary goal of the business. It's not IT anymore. IT comes as a, as a tool to support that. So it was quite different, I think. So how does it feel to work in such an organization where things are very different than other organizations, I believe? First thing that I noticed there is that the sector is very regulated. There are a lot of regulations, a lot of things to have to be compliant with. And you can start with, uh, with how you treat personal data, how you do your uh, investment reporting, how you basically work, what's your working environment, and whether you are taking care of your employees in a nice way, and, and things like that. So there are really different regulations about this sector. And these regulations, they have shaped the mindset of the people working there. One of the things that I noticed there was that people were afraid of making errors. And I can totally understand that, you know, as, a, as an organization that deals with money, you know, if you are supposed to receive some kind of uh, retirement amount, right, and it's different than what you expect, you wouldn't be satisfied as a, as a customer, right? So I can totally understand that when things go to money, people are really, really afraid of making errors. The problem was that this has extended to such a degree that people were afraid to make experiments in general, any kind of experiments. And this was something very difficult to change because when you want to do things in a different way, in a smarter way, you need to make experiments. You need to be able to make errors and be okay with that and learn from these errors. As I mentioned, we used external companies to deliver our software, but everything was deployed locally at our premises. It took really a long time to do it because everything had to be tested tens, maybe hundreds of times to be sure that, of course, there are no errors in this thing that we are deploying, right? Then we had to make sure that all the documents were written, we make sure that the people won't vote. So it was quite a stressful period for all the people or for many people involved in this company right there. When I started there, although, you know, everything was supposed to be well documented, uh, everyone was supposed to know its role, there were many silos. People were working on one specific thing and very deep. So there wasn't really good collaboration between the people. So. For me, as a newcomer, it was very difficult to start and to find all the pieces, how they work together. So it took me a lot of time to talk to a lot of different people in order to gather all this information. So the question I asked myself was, how, how do we start? How do we build something from the scratch in such an environment? How do we start this in-house development team? And how do we build something that can be uh, used in the future, something that we can rely on when we develop software for, for this pension fund. Well, we need to go, right? When we start working on something, when we start creating a process or using a tool or whatsoever, we need to go because these goals are what we aim to, right? And this is what you want to support with all the implementations that we are going to do. And our goal was to deliver value, right? We want all to deliver value to our customers on a frequent basis. And you know, you can apply this to every company out there, right? Every company wants to deliver value to their customers, right? And this should happen on a frequent basis. 
How frequent is that? Every day, every week, every month? You know, this is very different from company to company, and there isn't the right answer to this question. But we took this as a starting point for our journey of implementing Agile practices in this pension fund. You know, in such an environment, it's extremely easy to make things complicated. It took really a while because they are already complicated, and people are really used to work with complicated things. So our ambition was to make it as simple as possible and to keep it as simple as possible for as long as possible, right? Because every complexity will make things even more complex in the future. One of the first things to notice is that we need to start building a development, right? Before getting to the deployment pipeline, we need to make a development processing in place right there. And one of the simplest things to do is basically trunk-based development. We start with one very simple model where we have only one branch and everyone works in the same branch. We commit to the same branch, we make builds from the same branch, right? At some point, though, we realized that it wasn't always possible to do this, so we needed to introduce something. And then we said, all right, we will make some short-lived feature branches where we develop some feature and commit this into the master branch as soon as possible. This process evolved in the future with pull requests where we said, all right, we need to collaborate more with the development team, so we need to review each other's contributions to this map. So we introduced the pull requests where everything uh, is uh, basically reviewed be before it gets merged into the master branch. The problem with the long-lived branches is that it makes the picture very, very complex. And I have seen places, branches that lived over years and they are still in use. And when you go there, you don't know already what the state of your system is anymore. So we wanted to eliminate this already from the start. We wanted to keep the things very, very shortly, if, if necessary at all, to have a separate branch for that. Another important thing was that we needed to build trust in this organization. Before we started the development, everything was done outside, right? The development was done outside, but the pension fund used enormous time to test these deliveries that we got from them, to test them, to document them, and to deploy them afterwards, because everything was done manually. And you can imagine how stressful it was for many people to do this. Fortunately, it was just a couple of times a year, why? because you deploy only just three or four times a year, but still it was very, very uh, unpleasant activities for many people, right? So we wanted to turn this into the others. I wanted to automate as much as possible from the work we do, and leave only the few things to be manual tested by, by some people out there. So if you take a look at this, it's a very, very simple example of one of our test cases. And, uh, and we have an open web page where you have to log in with the NEMID if you're not from Denmark. NEMID is basically a national authentication service here in Denmark. So it's a two-factor authentication. You have to log in with the username and password, and then you have to enter a code, right? And then after you log in, you have to, you can do, as a, as a user, you can do different processes. You can maybe retire yourself online, or you can fill in any kind of uh, blankets or whatsoever, right? So if you have to test all these processes, you imagine that as a tester, you have to do this manually, and you have to do this many times, because every time a new version of the system comes out, you have to retest the previous things to make sure that they are still valid, right? And it is taking a lot of time to do this. So what we do, we started automating these things just from the bottom. We started uh, using Canyon because we work with, with C Sharp and Microsoft technologies. But we started using a lot of unit tests from the basic. Then we have some integration tests. We use primarily REST API between our systems. So we started building some integration tests between these systems. And at the end, unfortunately, we had to use Selenium because, hey, we have to do some UI tests as well. Uh, but we try to cover as much as possible from the same test case so that people will only focus on the things that are not really testable or not really automatable in this way. 
how does the process look like? Well, we decided to build a simple system or a simple pipeline for our continuous integration pipeline. So we start with the, with the building code, right? We use Git. Then we are running our unit test. Then we are running some code analysis to make sure that our code is uh, compliant with some standards that we have agreed upon as a team or as an organization. And then at the end, if everything goes fine, then we can create a deployable package from out this, from our So this is it's the same problem for every our system. So it's exactly the same. And this helps us a lot because you are, from, once you learn it, you apply the same knowledge to every different system. And even if you are a new developer in the company, you can easily start using that. One of our ambitions in the beginning was when we create software to be always deployable. Basically, every time we have a package out there, we want to make sure that we can deploy this package to one of our environments. It doesn't mean that the package is correct when it gets deployed, but it can be deployed easily. But in order to do this, we need to build a development culture, because development culture comes before any other thing. No matter how many tools you use, no matter how many different practices you try to apply, it's the culture that forms your team and, and the way you do development. Because, you know, there are many examples of things that look very nice on the surface, but then uh, the end result is actually corrupted, right? We all, all know about these things. So we make sure that we are people and the people do the software out there. The first deployments when we started, it was, everything was done manually. So a person has to log on on a virtual machine, has to manually copy files there, configure them, and then everything should be fine. But it never was. Because we are, we are humans, we make mistakes. And uh, when you have to do something repeatable, we are very bad at this. Computers are much better than us in doing that. And this is just an example of what, I was, uh, what you could see one of the servers, right? You could see all these different files with different copies of each other and with different configurations. So you know, it, was, it was a mess, and it, you weren't sure what kind of version of what application was on these machines, right? So it was very difficult to get an idea what was, what was happening there. So again, the next step was how do we change this? We wanted to create an automated pipeline where things go through the same pipeline no matter what. And it should be exactly the same pipeline for all our systems, right? Because we want to keep things simple and similar to each other. So what we did was we wanted to create a very simple pipeline that gets the package from TeamCity and applies a set of steps, basically different scripts, how to configure this, then verifies the installation by maybe running some post-install uh, tests, and then giving us feedback to the developers or the, the ones who are interested what the states of this deployment was. And uh, in order to apply this, though, we needed two things to be done. First thing was that we needed to make sure that our environments are exactly the same. Doesn't matter if it's a test environment or it's a production environment, they have to be the same. And um, in many situations, I have seen that uh, production environment runs or maybe one kind of machine, maybe there is a load balancer, but there isn't load balancer on your test machine, then you get different things, right? So you could get really difficult times debugging your application, because when an error occurs, you don't know what's the problem. Is it the setup, the configuration, or is it your application that is running out there? So this was one of the first things that we wanted to make sure, that the things are exactly the same. Our test environments, they have load balancer. Our production environments, they have load balancer as well. Another important thing for us was to make sure that we built only one package and deploy this package to different environments. So we don't build a package for each environment separately, but we build only one package, and we leave the configuration to a separate system to inject this into the, the package when it gets deployed. Why is this important? Well, you can imagine that when you have the same package deployed to you, and when you have the same environment configuration there, well, 
if there is an error on your test environment, then you know that it's going to fail on all other environments. Or if you take the opposite, if you get an error on your production environment that you haven't seen on the previous, then probably something is wrong there, right? So we, went, we wanted to be able to get errors as quickly as possible in this process so that we can fix them before they reach production. And to do this, we use one of my favorite tools, Octopus Deploy, if you're familiar with that. It's a very, very simple tool where you can define your pipelines, and uh, it does exactly what I told you. It gets the packages. You use different scripts. You could be PowerShell scripts or, or any other kind of scripts that you're familiar with. And then you can put this on your environment. So it gives you a fantastic overview of your production or all over uh, your systems, versioning, release notes, etc. It's really one of my favorite tools in general, uh, I think. And the, the people who develop it, they're, they're just great and very, very, very good at, uh, at support. So I can definitely recommend Octopus Deploy for that. But hey, we are developers, right? So when we develop code, what we want to do is we want this code to go into production as soon as possible because production is the only place where the code gets used, right? Because if it doesn't go there, well, it's a waste of our time, isn't it? So the question then gets, how do we deploy to production? We have established a, a system which is composed of automatic and some manual steps, but basically, we decided to take, instead of getting to automate the entire process, that we do this in steps. Because, hey, people were used to work manually from that, and now we are suddenly introducing a lot of automated things there. So, you know, it was a big change for the people working in the pension fund. So we decided to do this in different steps. And we started by saying that, okay, we, we, we built, we create our package, we deploy this to our test environment, we run the automated test there. Probably there are some manual acceptance tests. And then we could do this to uh, deploy this to production. Again, this is a manual process where we make sure that everything is, uh, is related. We have generated release nodes automatically out from our commit messages. And then at the end, we do some manual post-deployment test if necessary for that. So it's a really combination between automated steps and some manual steps that we have uh, we have put in between. The question now is how often shall we deploy to production, right? Uh, you've seen examples of Amazon deploying maybe hundreds of times a day to production. Shall we follow the same model? Or maybe we can do it once a day or once a month? It's a difficult question and there isn't a right answer to that. But we needed to make this more often, because just a few times a year, that was, that was not enough. And because people were very afraid of doing this, because the process was very difficult and very complicated, so people were really afraid of putting code into production, because what if an error occurs out there, right? So we wanted to change this and make deployments more often to production. And this is the only way that you can overcome your fears. And I can, I can remember the first time we put something uh, on production. It was, it, was, it was a magic. Everyone was there, uh, ready with the champagne. And uh, it, was, it was a nice moment after all. So, uh, so the first time was very difficult, but then uh, it becomes better with the time. So this uh, chart here shows the mean time between the, the days since the package was created and since it was put on production. So you could see in the beginning, it took us like a month, more than a month to deploy to production, right, the first couple of times. But then now, nowadays, we do this at least once, twice, or three times a week. And in theory, we can do this many times. We can do this every day. We have just found a rhythm that matches, that works well for us, for our organization. The problem is, though, that when we deploy so often, we don't get champagne every day, right? So. That's, that's, a, that's a thing, but hey. But now we run into another problem, because we are deploying so often to production that we can risk deploying something that wasn't supposed to be there yet. You know, we have a communication department who has some campaigns that, you know, they need to be timed very well. And uh, then we said, well, what do we do? What we do is that we start talking about two separate activities. We have the deployment process, which means that we are putting code on production. And then we have the release process, which means that 
we are making a feature official. Basically, we are publishing it so that everyone can, can see this. And um, how do we split? How do we do often deployments without releasing things right away? One of the very simple things to do is feature toggles. Feature toggles is really, really a simple mechanism where you have, you can think of a Boolean flag that you, that you have in your code that says whether a feature is enabled or not, right? So you can have so many of these features and put them in your code and you can deploy your systems basically every day without really releasing your code to your end users. So by using this simple mechanism, it makes it really easy to deploy often without uh, having problems with your communication colleagues. Another important thing that we wanted to apply was how not to disturb our users because when you are deploying during the day maybe or a couple of times a day, there may be some users doing something important online on our web page, right? So we didn't want to disturb them. And one of the simple tactics that we applied there was the so-called zero downtime deployment. And uh, it works like this, that we have a load balancer with at least two servers. So what we do is we take out the server, we update the application there, test it, do everything, and then attach it to the load balancer again. And then we do the same with the other server. So with this technique, we could basically update our systems in real time without our end users seeing what is happening behind the scenes, right? It gives us a lot of flexibility. Great, we have implemented something, a version of continuous delivery where we have a really automated pipeline. We have some manual steps in between, but again, we believe that this is the way it works for us. Then the next step is continuous deployment. Why? We have basically automation all over the place. And the question is, uh, shall we go further now? I have a, uh, had a conversation with one of my friends, and uh, he, was, uh, he was telling me, well, we do continuous deployment, we have uh, all these things. And then I was, I was saying, interesting, okay, it's really automated, everything. No, 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 we have some manual things all the way. And I said, well, then it's continuous delivery you're doing. No, no, it can't be continuous delivery. We have Docker, we have all these cool things. He says, well, yes, if it's not really automated, so it's probably not continuous deployment out there. But the question is, shall we do continuous deployment after that? Well, we have decided not to do this. Just because there is hype around it and people are talking around it doesn't mean that you have to apply it in your organization. We have found a rhythm that works well for us, and we believe that this rhythm allows us to deliver value to our customers on a frequent basis. So that's why we don't see a point in continuing and automating the whole process, although in theory everything can be done really automated because our tools support this right there. Great. The title of this talk is about creating a robust deployment pipeline. So the question is, what is really a robust deployment pipeline? How do we define this thing out there? For me, deployment pipeline supports your goals, your agile practices. So you need, you need your practices out there, and your deployment pipeline is just a realization, just an implementation in your own organization. There isn't anything right or wrong. Everything is really context-specific, and all that I showed you today is just something that we found that works fine for us in this transitional period. But then, robust deployment pipeline is really about confidence. How confident you feel that you can deliver value to your end user, because it's all about value, right? That's why we are here because we want to deliver value in one or another way. And I believe that robustness comes into really about confidence, how, how you feel about this. And the question is, is it, is it something that stays at one place or, or is it something constant or it changes over time? Well, I believe that as a job evolves, organization evolves, practices change, and uh, your your goals may also change as an organization. This means that you have to constantly come back and reassess your deployment pipeline and see what works best for you in this current state that you are in. Because there isn't anything constant in this world. We live in a very dynamic world, and I believe that only our common understanding and common 
improvements in this way will help us to, to survive in this. Thank you so much for being here today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.